They said that she wasn't going to make it, and she's at rehab. She's doing great. She'll probably be home in about a week. Hallelujah. So why don't you stand with us? We're open in prayer, and then we'll get into our music. Sound good? Hallelujah. Father God, we come to you this day, Lord God, and we worship you, Lord Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your power and your strength, Lord God, Father, and the miracles that you show us, Lord God. Father, we just ask you to inhabit our praise today, Lord God. Be in our service in your mighty holy name. And the Rock Church said, amen. Our Savior lives. God will reign forever, and all the world will know his name, and everyone together will sing the song of the redeemed. Cause I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what he did, my Savior, my Savior lives. trembles at his name and victory forever we sing the song of the redeemed come on it's our song i know that my redeemer lives and now i stand on what he did my savior my savior lives and every day's a brand new chance to say jesus you to proclaim it today. Our Savior lives. Here we go. My Savior lives. My Savior lives. My Savior lives. I can't hear you. Come on. My Savior lives. My Savior lives. My Savior lives. And I And now I stand on what he did. My Savior, my Savior lives. And every day's a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. And I know that my Redeemer lives. And now I stand on Say, Jesus, you are the only way. My Savior, my Savior lives. Hallelujah, he's alive, amen. Praise the Lord, give him praise this morning. Praise the Lord, he's alive and he's the only king, amen. Tell me. 
justice you will reign and every knee will bow and we bring our expectations our hope is anchored in your name the name of jesus who do we trust So we 
won't climb up coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me that never ends, it never changes, that all-powerful love that you have, Lord God. I thank you that there's no fear found in this place today because your perfect love casts out all fear. I thank you, Lord God, that the enemy is defeated because your love was shed on that cross for us. Your love, your blood flowed into this world. And so, Lord God, we have victory today. We thank you, we praise you for it, Heavenly Father. Lord, I just ask right now, by your Holy Spirit, you minister life and life abundantly to each of your people right now. If you need healing in your body, just take a deep breath. Just breathe in healing in the precious name of Jesus. The Spirit of God is here. The impossible becomes possible. Everything you need, God can do right now in your life. Hallelujah. We just thank you and we praise you, Lord God. You're moving in our lives, Lord, giving us strength in the midst of adversity, giving us courage in the middle of the battle, giving us peace, Lord God, when the enemy is raging. I thank you and I praise you for it, Lord, for you are our high tower, our shield and our buckler. You are our everything and we give you praise. We give you glory right now. In the precious name of Jesus and all the saints said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. If we can get the lights on. Praise God. We had another great uh, handing out of food yesterday. Many, many people ministered to. So praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm glad one person's excited about it. Two people. You know, it's an extension of our ministry, and when we're doing that, you all get blessed, amen? I mean, you know, because others were serving over here, giving away food, blessings were flowing in here for everyone that's a part of this church, amen? Amen. So praise God as we all do our work, every one of us does something different. Some may, may be in prayer deeply for all of us, and we just, I can't thank you enough. You know, a church without intercessors is a church that can't function. But a church that has intercessors, people praying for it, uh, praying for God's uh, leadership and guidance, that church is going to uh, be able to stand no matter what. Amen. Amen. So praise God. There are other of you that are out there witnessing and uh, telling people about Jesus and what a great and awesome thing that is, an evangelistic ministry. Praise God. So I want to thank all of you for everything you do. Amen. Amen. Turn around. Thank somebody for everything they're doing. Hallelujah. Now, t- now thank all the people that are on vacation this weekend because a whole bunch are. Thank you. Have a great time. God bless you. Have a great uh, vacation and enjoy yourselves and be blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. At this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Gary to come and uh, say a few words over the offering. Praise the Lord. Let's welcome Pastor Gary and Gary, our usher up also. This is the double Gary.
Okay. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. That ought to be a unanimous response from everybody sitting out here. Because if you're not trusting God and giving him glory, then you all are missing out on a wonderful benefit. Everything that pastor said earlier about who God is for us, our shield, our strength, our high tower, our provider to those who believe he is. And since I know as I look out here, because I don't really see any strange faces, I go, you're all believers, so let's try this one last time. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it is your faithfulness with your tithes and offerings. We are so blessed as a church to have a congregation who is faithful with their tithes and offerings. It causes the church to be able to operate. But even more important, it connects you, myself, in the kingdom of God to all of his promises. And those are all yes and amen. So, you know, you greeted everybody and we gave congratulations to people for being in different ministries. I just want you to and with a loud hand clap, congratulate yourselves for being so faithful with your tithes and offerings. So, Father, we just bring this forth and hold it up to you, Lord. For truly the giving is not into the rock church, but it is into your kingdom. And in your kingdom... Your promises are yes and amen. And as we have been faithful, we just recognize that you are the author of faithfulness. You are faithful to your word and every word that's in that Bible, every word of protection, every word of who we are in Christ and what Christ accomplished at the cross being ours because we trust and we believe in you and believe in that finished work. We thank you that we are participators in that life that we have been made a new creation, that we have died to self and been resurrected with Christ, and that we have a seat in heaven alongside our Lord and our Savior. And we have mansions being prepared for each and every one of us. And we just praise you, Lord, for all the things you do in the background, all the things that we don't even see things that don't happen to us that we don't even realize were about to happen because of your protection and your angels going forth and standing guard over us. And we just praise you and thank you. From the depths of our hearts, Lord, we cannot think of a better God to serve the only true God, you, Jehovah. And we thank you and praise you for this. We thank you for the opportunity to still come and assemble ourselves and hear the word of God come forth and bring life to us through your word. We ask, Lord, that you continue to anoint our pastor as he brings forth the truth, the unadulterated truth of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, Gary didn't see any strange faces. I don't see any strangers, but I see some strange faces. Saw one this morning when I looked in the mirror. (laughs) Praise the name of the Lord. Just want to give you guys a little uh, update. Uh, As you know, I've told you about the two storms coming in. One a low pressure, one a high pressure. And it's all designed to change systems. Well, uh, in the last month, the Office of the Controller of Currency uh, just sent out to every bank in the United States to start switching over to digital currency and to open, open digital accounts for anyone who requests it. So uh, you can actually go to your bank now and ask for a digital currency account, and uh, they have to, by law now, start switching you over to digital currency. So, folks, we're getting close. PayPal announced this week that they're accepting digital currency now for payment on uh, anything you're buying on a worldwide scale. So. 
uh, one of our systems is changing drastically, and that's our currency system. Amen? And I want you to know that no one can change this. The president can't change it. Congress can't change it. No one has authority over the controller of currency, uh, the comptroller. It's a federal agency. They said we're doing it to switch uh, so that we can meet with world standards because I told you all the reserve banks are now going, uh, opening digital departments in, in them. So, folks, things are changing uh, rapidly around us, so we need to get ready for what's happening in our world. Amen. And when I say get ready, that means be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Have yourself built up in faith because it's going to take faith. Amen. Many of the large market people are saying right now, folks, this is what's being said this week, that the change to digital currency going into the banks is going to bankrupt over 80 million people. They're going to lose their retirements unless they start switching to digital currency. Said it's the most massive transfer of funds ever in the history of the world just by a letter that was sent out by this agency telling all the banks you have to start doing this. So they said it's, it's going to be uh, amazing. You're also seeing digital currency advertised now on television all the time, the Greystone uh, Investment Trust Funds. So folks, everything in the world is getting ready to flow that way. And that's why the scripture says that you will not be able to buy or sell anything because digital currency, every penny is tracked. Amen? Every penny, every transaction is tracked within a nanosecond. They know exactly where you got your money and what you're spending it on. And uh, one good thing about it, and if there's anything good about it, is uh, eventually you won't have to do tax returns because they'll know everything you made and everything you spent, and they'll do it automatically, and they'll send you either a bill or a check. How many of you want to get out of here before that happens? <laughs> So anyway, just wanted to bring you up to date on some of the, the system we've been telling you about, but it's, it's now happened into high gear, and folks, it could happen that they declare that everything has to go digital by January 1st, so we're going to wait and see what's happening there, but anyway, praise the Lord. We're going to continue on our study of the seven churches as we're looking at the hearts of men, our hearts, as we're looking at the condition of the church, and uh, today we're on Philadelphia. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, Philadelphia is a great church. And folks, if there's a church you want to be a part of that's listed here in the book of Revelation, it's the church of Philadelphia. Now, that doesn't mean you have to move to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a church that God talks about because it is a church that is, and it actually existed back in the time of John, uh, that is a church that stood in faith. Everybody say stood in faith. It had strength, a little strength, and it was based in faith. They believed and they were faithful to the Word of God. They didn't let their emotions govern their decisions or their actions. They let the Word of God define how they were going to respond to a situation. Amen? And so if you open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, we're going to see how God presents himself to uh, this church Because again, as I've been teaching you and showing you, what God says about himself tells you about what he's going to do with that church. It tells you how he's going to either move against them or for them. And he's bringing them a word of clarity showing who he is. As he reveals, if you will, the character of the church, he's also revealing his character and how he introduces himself and how he stands and what kind of anointing is going to flow from his throne to the people of the world, to the church specifically. So here in uh, verse 7 of chapter 3, it says this, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. Here he says that he is holy and true. First off, that's a description of the church. It's holy and true. It's not trafficking in sin. That word trafficking is how God described uh, Satan after he fell from heaven, said he trafficked with all of God's creation and defiled it. In other words, they got them to be an interactive sin among themselves. 
And here it's we're, we're, we're trafficking in holiness. In other words, your holiness and how you're walking in Christ, his holiness in you, is impacting other people, and it's causing them to repent from sin and be drawn to the living God. So this church is a church that is developing, if you will, the character and the nature of God because God said that we are partakers of his divine nature. Amen? And they are literally doing that, and they are encouraging each other to walk in the holiness of God. Now, two things happens, uh, should be happening when this is going on. One, the church has to be close. They have to be close with one another. There has to be interaction between all of the people in the church. Amen? Okay. Are you, how, many, how many of you are at the Rock Church this morning? Okay, praise the Lord. There has to be an interaction between us because if, if, if I don't know you, then what God is doing in my life is not going to touch you. As we come together and we encourage one another, as we pray for one another, as we have uh, social events together, and what's a social event today with coronavirus? A phone call, a text, an email, Amen. It is that connection that keeps you being of one heart, one mind, and in one accord. Why do you think the enemy used coronavirus to separate all of us? It's because the enemy knows when we are in one accord, there is a great outpouring of the corporate anointing of God. He's trying to stop what God says is going to happen in the last days in a group of people. And it doesn't just mean one church. It means people in different churches, but they're all a part of Philadelphia because their heart is sold out for God. Amen? So it's not a church in town. It is who we are in Christ, and there can be all of us in different churches all over town. Amen? So God doesn't want us to exalt our church. He wants us to exalt Him so that we become the church the way we should be in him, amen? So there's an interaction and just being able to to share with you and talk with you and give you counsel one with another. God says, seek counsel among the righteous, amen? Then I help counsel you, you help counsel someone from doing something that is wrong and counsel them into doing that which is right before God. But to do that, you have to be close enough that you are transparent one with another. And the word tells us, be ye transparent one with another that you might be healed. Amen. Healed can be translated delivered, saved, washed clean. Amen. So that you have to be transparent. Today, the enemy has got us so we want to have private lives. We don't want anyone to, to know about us until Facebook came along. And then we found out more about you than we wanted to. And the enemy decided to make it that way because he saw that now social community could happen, but he turned it into a gossip line rather than a ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. And of course, the men who run it had no idea, amen, that God could use it as a holy vessel. Amen. But folks, if we're going to be used on Facebook or Twitter or any social event, We need to be bringing forth the word of God, bringing forth sound counsel, bringing forth the conviction of the Holy Spirit into people's lives. Hallelujah. Three weeks ago, I taught a message and Facebook blanked me out and they've never let me back on and they won't give me no reason why that that sermon can't be played, but they've stopped it because it was all about living with God and condemning or bringing conviction to the ones that are in sin. The enemy wants to shut that voice down. We as a church, folks, we need to be that voice one with another and not be such private people that we are caught up in our sin or in our shame or in our hurt or in our pain and we have no one that is praying for us other than just a select circle because we don't want anyone else to know. Good word, Pastor. Amen? Amen? Now, you need to choose who you share with because you don't want that to become a gossip line, but 
someone that's going to make it a prayer line before the Lord God Almighty. And that's what a church should be, is we are a prayer line for the kingdom of God. Praying one for another and lifting one another up. Amen. So he is holy and he is true. So this means that they were in the word of God. Because his word is truth. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So he's holy. He's communicating his holiness. We're communicating his holiness. And then we are communicating his truth in that. Because folks, everything in God is rooted in holiness. And the perversion is God is love. When I say perversion, they take away his holiness and they just say God is love. Therefore, love accepts everybody, everything, every sin, doesn't, does, doesn't bring conviction, doesn't tell them they're doing it wrong. We're just supposed to love them in their sin without ever bringing the truth. Well, what the fact that he says holy and true tells us that he is bringing conviction into people's lives so that they can be set free. That's the purpose of God. Amen. We love people in their sin, but we do not condone it, nor do we accept it. Right. Right. Boy, you guys are really quiet. Everybody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Then he says this. He says that he has the key of David. The key of David is not only about the authority of the throne or the kingdom of God, but it is much more than that. It is the key that allows you, through God, to step through and use the key to get into heaven. I give you the keys to the kingdom. I gave you the key to the throne. You have access to God where in that presence of God, doors can be closed that no man can open and doors can be open that no man can close. Hallelujah. But it's in the key that gets you into the throne room. And folks, that key of David is the mercy of God, for you cannot enter the, key, the throne room of God unless you obtain that mercy from God. You are ushered out. It's only with that mercy do you find his grace, and the doors are opened and the doors are shut. So it's holiness and truth that opens that door, that holiness and that truth, that mercy of God. That opens that door for you to that throne room of God. And you'll say, well, the door's already open. That is, folks, listen to me. I know many Christians that have never been in the presence of God where they felt him, heard him, where God was moving upon them in very profound manner. They just say, I believe in God, but they've never had an experience with God, and yet God invites you into the throne room, and if you don't know how to use the keys to the kingdom, the door is seemingly shut to you. It looks like it's shut to you. God is telling you it's in this wonderful relationship of my holiness and my truth that this key is placed in your hands. Now, not only that, but in Isaiah chapter 22, it's a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 20, it says, Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility to his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now, how many of you know that the perfect servant, the perfect steward is Jesus Christ? It's not only about a man back then, but it is a prophetical word about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then it says in verse 22, the key to the, of the house of David, I will lay on his shoulder. If you know about the priestly garments, the priestly garments had, had patches on their shoulders. They had ornament. They had the, the, the uh, jewels on their chest, which represented the 12 tribes. This is where all authority was reigning, on their shoulders and on their chest. It is where the mind and the heart of God was developed for his people and given into the authority of man, that man might minister that same heart and that same love to bring Israel into the knowledge of God and to bring the Gentiles into the knowledge of God. Jesus Christ was given this so that he could win all men to him and bring them to the Father. 
And it says, he shall open and no, man, no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him as a peg in a secure place, and he will become glorious, thrown to his father's house. Jesus is that glorious throne in the father's house. He has the key. So listen to me. In the authority of God, when Jesus does something, no one can stop it because he's the king of kings. He has complete and total authority. And what he's saying to this church is, because you understand faith, and that faith generates the authority of God, what you're doing cannot be undone. That you are able to stand against the enemy because you are able to close a door on him and open doors in the kingdom of God. That is when God said, when you are under such great attack, I will provide a way of escape for you. Amen. I will provide a way under my authority, under this key of David, under the kingdom of the living God, I will give you the ability to close doors and open doors of the kingdom so that you're constantly in the flow of God, in the provision of God, and you're stopping the attack of the enemy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, folks, that doesn't mean you won't be persecuted, but it means the enemy has no inroad into your soul. The doors of your soul are closed. He can't deceive you. He can't misguide you because you're closing those doors. And in the midst of persecution, you can still rejoice with great joy. In the midst of sorrow, you can still rejoice. In the midst of pain, you can still rejoice. He's telling this church, you found the answer to the kingdom. You found how to live in the kingdom of God. And you're not allowing your emotions, as I said earlier, to determine your actions. Some people get so upset here, they make a decision to do this or go here, and it's not according to God's will nor God's word. Amen. They let how they're feeling dictate how they're going to act, and then they just get into more snares because every time you respond to your emotion and your feeling, and it's not the direction of God, you're simply stepping into another snare of the enemy. He's catching you another way. Now he's got both arms caught, both legs caught, and you're not going anywhere but under his control. That's why it says when the enemy has captured you with sin, he can come and take you anytime he wants you. Scripture's very clear about that. If you're living in sin, the enemy has a place in you, and he can come and take you at any time. That's why Jesus told his disciples, us... All of us who believe in him, give no place for the enemy. Don't give him a place to have control in any area of your life because if he does, he can come and take you when he wants you. In other words, cause you to stumble again. In other words, cause you to believe the lie. Cause you to desire the sin. Amen? So that he gets you stumbling again so he can control more of you. Amen? So he's telling this church that you are actually doing what you need to do. The doors are being shut and the precious doors of heaven are being opened. Hallelujah. Folks, that's why there should be no fear in the body of Christ because we can shut the door on the enemy and open the doors of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have access to the throne of God. His blessings are already guaranteed because he said, all of my promises, my answers to them are yes and amen. I've got the promises ready. I just need you to believe. Amen. I need you to believe and stand in faith and quit the squirming and swishy swashy walk, but make the way straight and stand according to the word of God. And that's why he says, I am true. Because this word is true, which means you have to be in this word. Amen. Holy means you're being led, if you will, by the Spirit of God as he teaches you truth. The key says you're going to use that authority of that word to stay in the kingdom of God, the presence of God, the purity of God, and have your victory over all the power of the enemy. Hallelujah. So he says, I know your works in verse 8. I know your works in verse 8. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know your works in verse 8. God knows everything. Didn't he say this to every church? I know your works. So far, every church, he said, I know your works. He knows exactly what you're doing, what's the motivation of your heart in doing it, where you're captured in sin in doing it, where you're right with God in doing it. Amen. He knows everything about you. You cannot hide from God. So again, I want to just talk to you about, I know thy works. God, as I talked about earlier uh, in one of the meetings, was he sees all. You cannot hide from God. So it's time to have a really great social connection, if you will, with God. Because you can't hide it, so you might as well talk to him about it. Hallelujah. You might as well talk to him. That's why I love Isaiah chapter 1, 17 and 18 and 19, that we can come and reason with him. And though we have massive sin, we're going to be made clean. And if we're willing and obedient, we're going to eat of the good of the land. Amen. I love that because we need to have a social, if you will, again, communication with God, a prayer line that is open, and honesty with God, amen, so that God can bring all of the victory into our hearts. Amen? And some people will tell God, please forgive me of this sin, but then they keep going back and committing the sin and come back and say, God, forgive me, and they go back and sin again, and then they go back and ask for forgiveness, and they go back and sin again. It's because they're not having the right kind of communication with God. It's not just about asking for the repentance or to to, to say, I'm sorry. It's about God Show me the weakness in myself that's causing me to get captured. Talk to me about what's capturing me and bringing me back to this same sin. Amen. Amen. It's having an open and honest discussion with God why, why you are captured in your mind because your mind is where you always go back to your sin. Amen? Ask him why this is going on. Many people, you know, today have psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors, and they're all trying to figure out, why do I do what I do? Well, how about go to the master counselor and ask him? Why do I do what I do? Why why am I still captured by this, and I've been captured for 10 years? Why, why am I still falling in the same area, Lord God? I've repented. I've said I'm sorry. I've quoted scripture over it. I've had people pray over me. Why do I keep going back? That's the discussion you need to have with God because he knows what happened to you. He knows how it got lodged in you. He knows how the enemy attacked you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why he's holy, he's true, and he's got the key. He has the authority to shut that door. Oh, come on, church. Hallelujah. This is what God says we can work in. This is why in Revelations 5, 9, and 10, it says that he is worthy to open the scrolls. Hallelujah. And begin to bring the the six seals into, into pass. He's, he's literally saying, you have, you have the authority, you are worthy to do it because you have the key of David. Amen? Amen. You know, the Bible, so you guys know, was not written in chapter and verses. Man, man, so man could study it, put chapter and verses in it. It was a flowing letter, and it was a flowing letter. You ha- he has the key of David, and this is why he's worthy to open the scroll. He has the authority to do it. He's the only one that can open that door. He's the only one that can protect his children and close that door. Hallelujah. So it wants us to understand that, folks, in our lives, the more we are obedient to this word, joyfully obedient to our Lord and Savior, believe in faith with all of our heart what this word says, the greater the authority in our lives. Because Christ is then living through us at a greater measure because he is the living word. He is the renewer of our mind. 
We are clothed in him. We have put on Christ. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because we believe in faith in his word. And many Christians say, I believe. I believe, Pastor Ed, I believe. And yet they will, they will get so angry at someone for absolutely nothing. You're not living the word. Christians will say, I'm living the word and have unforgiveness in their heart. You're not living the word. Christians will say, I'm obedient to God's word and then tell a lie. You're not living the word. We're talking about spirit, soul, and body. This church, this group of people, this group of people decided to sell out to the living God and live in the word, live in his holiness, and walk in his authority. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's possible, church, for each and every one of us that will dig into his word to know him, not to be able to quote scripture, but to be able to know him who speaks scripture, who lives and is the scripture. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So then he goes on and he says this, I know your works. Amen. Amen. I have set before you an open door. I have set before you. Now, did he tell any other church that he had set an open door before him? No. This church, he said, the door is open. To every other church, he said, repent. Repent, and the door will be open. Repent, and you'll be okay. To this one, he said, the door's standing open. Hallelujah. How many want that door open? Glory to God. Amen. How many, how many want to go to heaven and the doors close when you get there? <laughs> Wouldn't that be a shock? Amen. To get, get all the way to the front door and the door is closed. Well, what happened to the ten virgins? Five didn't keep filled with the Holy Spirit and they went to the door and Jesus opened it and said, depart from me, I never knew you. Whoa. Whoa. You go study that one and see what it's really saying to you. Amen. But this church has the door open. Praise the Lord. Now, if the door's open, how many of you know you can hear much clearer? How many of you have ever closed the door so you wouldn't hear what was going on in the other room? Amen. But the door is open, which means you're going to hear God's voice clearly. You're going to be able to receive from the living God. You're going to have a unrestricted access to the Lord Jesus Christ, yes. to the Father in heaven. Amen? Yes. It's not inhibited by anything. It's not restricted by anything. The access is there. What a report for this church. Amen? Amen. Turn to someone, man, and say, man, I'm, I'm praying I'm in this church. <laughs> now then, I want to say, tell you something, folks. If you're praying you're in this church then you got to start changing like you're in this church. Hallelujah. Praying, God, help, help me be that way, and then resist him when he tells you to change doesn't do any good. That's empty prayers. You're just wanting God to do it with no action on your part. You're wanting God to make it so easy you don't have to do anything. But God says, I'm looking for faithful people. This church, he's saying there's a reward for you because you are faithful. So I can tell you this right now, folks. Every one of us can discern right now by the Spirit of God whether we are this church or not. You can discern in your spirit whether you, because you already know if you're obedient to God or not. You already know if you're seeking God and talking with God. You already know if you have a, a, a wonderful relationship with him. You already know that you respond when he brings conviction. You already know if you're battling against God. Amen? If you're battling in your heart against the word of God and the truth. Amen? And I don't want anybody to judge me. Who do you think you are? Are you holier than thou? If you're that way, you're already not in the church of Philadelphia. So... It's not to bring condemnation, it's to bring an evaluation so you can get into the church of Philadelphia. 
It's just measuring yourself, amen? How many of you love to take tests? One guy loves to take tests, Charlie. Most of us never wanted to take a test, but what does a test tell you? Tells you where you're at, amen? We're helping my my six-year-old granddaughter, Mia, with she brings home math and, and spelling words and all these things, and, and we're, having, we're helping her learn how to spell, how to do math, amen? amen? She takes a test, and that tells us and her how good she's learning, amen? Well, God's going to tell this church in a minute, you don't even have to take the test, because it's already been proven that you know what you've been taught. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. Praise the Lord. Not only one raised his hand. He, he likes to take tests. So the rest of you ought to say, I want to get in the church of Philadelphia just so I don't have to take a test. Hallelujah. Amen. So he says, I know your works. I'm seeing it all. I see And I have set a door before you that no one can shut. In other words, because you're walking in who I am, holy, true, and under my authority in my kingdom, under that anointing, that door is already open for you. Hallelujah. And no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word. They've kept the word and not denied his name. And his name means his character, because the word name in Greek means his deity, his authority, his nature, his character, means everything that God, that Jesus Christ is. So when we invoke the name of Jesus, it means all of his authority, all of his character, all of his nature, everything that he says he is. Amen? You have kept my name. You know who I am, and you're allowing me to be God in you. How many times have you taken God off the throne and put yourself on it because you wanted to do it my way? Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay, the rest of you, we'll have to really deal with that. Hallelujah. You know, I don't know who, who, who sung I Left My Heart. In San Francisco. I don't know, somebody. There's only one place we can leave our hearts, and that's in Christ. Amen? We have to leave our heart in Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. And to know that I have loved you. Hallelujah. He's literally talking about a great revival in the last days for those who are of the church of Philadelphia. Who are walking in this. It may not be an entire church revival. But in your life, you're having revival. You're leading people. You're winning people. You're standing in God. You're hearing his voice. You're doing the works of God. Because it's implied, not as a whole church, but it's implied as I know each and every one of you, I know your works. Hallelujah. Amen? So he says, if you have this, praise God, there's going to be a drawing of people to you in the last days. Amen? I said there's going to be a drawing of people to you in the last days. Folks, a milk toast gospel does not produce holiness and truth and the key of David. A gospel taught that causes you to realize you are a soldier of light. And to be that soldier, you have to be in boot camp. And to be in boot camp, you have to be trained. You have to be exercised. You have to be ready for the battle. I believe that God has been getting us ready for the battle that is to come. And if we are exercised and we are prayed up and studied up, the church of Philadelphia will be realized in each and every one of us and every other Christian out there that is doing the same thing. Hallelujah. 
So God wants us to know, because folks, listen to me. If all I heard is that God loves me and that I'm not accountable for anything, then when the battle comes, I don't know how to fight. I don't know how to use the authority of God. I don't know how to use the key to open a door and shut a door. Because I've never been taught how to do that. Amen? So now I scram- would be scrambling trying to find answers from God. Well, how many people has tragedy come into their life or struggle into their life and they're not ready for it and they don't know how to get through and it utterly crushes them for a period of time because they're under the weight of the enemy. They're under the weight of the situation, the grief or whatever it is. They're under that instead of under the throne, under the presence of God, where God can keep you and hold you and make you secure in his arms and to give you joy in the midst of your greatest battle. Amen? Amen. You have to know that God's word is fully alive. It's fully equipped and it's fully empowered. This church is walking in that type of relationship with the living God. Amen? Amen? He didn't say they were super strong. He says you have a little strength. Folks, if you are having a little strength in every area of your life, you are an overcomer. Because the blows of the enemy are so vast, so many, coming from not only the enemy himself and all the fallen angels, but by all the people that he stirs up against you and all the circumstances he tries to cause. But if you can stay strong in every area of your life, you are growing in God. Amen? Hallelujah. So they had strength. They were living for God. And he said, it's going to be seen in the last days by your enemies. And your enemies are going to finally know the truth. Hallelujah. That's why in Isaiah it tells us that the glory of the Lord has risen. The glory of the Lord has come upon you. And it tells you that your children and noblemen will come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Because I will be revealed in the midst of you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. These days God is raising up an army to stand up and do battle. And how do you do battle? Say no to the wisdom of man and yes to the wisdom of God. Say no to the sin of this world and yes to the holiness of God. Bring your body into subjection, renew your mind, put on Christ, and hallelujah, you're going to be victorious in the living God. You have a good communication system with God. How many of you, he wakes you up in the middle of the night and gets you praying? How many of you wake up in the middle of the night and you don't know what for? I'm going to tell you something I found out in God. I don't know why sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night, but I know what I do when I wake up in the middle of the night. I start praying because I went to God and I asked him, Father, is it you waking me up or the, or the, or the food I had at dinner? Amen? Was it, was it Ida's hot sauce that's waking me up? And God says, what difference does it make why you awoke? Pray. Just pray. Start praying. Start interceding. And even if it was the enemy or something natural, you can turn it into something rewarding that is spiritual and according to the kingdom of God. Amen. And we need to do that in all of our ways. Always look for how can I grow in the midst of this? Because God said, I will not allow anything to happen to you that is not profitable for you. So whatever's happening, God has profit for you. How many like profit over lack? Hallelujah. He has profit for you in every situation if you will go to him and ask him, "What what can I do here, now, to grow and profit in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. God will always use it. Some of you look at your situations and say, God, this is overwhelming. 
You're, you need to get your eye off the situation and say, what am I supposed to do in the midst of this because I'm supposed to profit in the middle of this? Yes. So talk to me, Lord, about how to grow. Yes. Amen. 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 And overcome in the midst of this yes. rather than letting it continually weigh you down. This church, Philadelphia, learned how to overcome the persecution, the struggles of life, everything that was happening. They learned how to turn everything into a profit, into growth in Christ Jesus. Yes. That is a key for you and I in everything in our lives. Amen? Amen. Everything in our lives. Praise the Lord. The other day I had to have my car towed to get something fixed because the, the, uh, uh, the what's it, hydraulic pump system went out on, on my little Mercedes. And again, if you've seen me driving a red sports car Mercedes, I do have one. In fact, I have two, but I only paid $16,000 for the new one. I could have bought a Chevy for 40. I bought a Mercedes for 16 because I like a convertible. I didn't spend 100000 although it looks like a $150,000 car. Anyway, they had to tow it. I couldn't drive it. But I, I said, well, Father, there's got to be a purpose in here for one, why it broke and, and, and what happened here. The tow driver comes up, and he didn't say, wow, you have a nice car. He looked at my son Ryan's truck and said, wow, that's a cool-looking truck. First off, I wanted to rise up and say, well, what about my car? But I got to talk to him about Jesus. I got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. And when I went over to Mercedes, I got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with my service attendant. You see, there's a purpose. God, God has people ready. We look at it and say, oh, bad thing. God looks at it and says, no, 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 good thing. I'm, you're going to win some people to Jesus. You're going to encourage someone else in their faith. Amen. Everything that happens, look for how God can move in your life. This church was doing that. They were walking in his holiness. They were walking in his truth. They were walking in his authority, his anointing, and they were allowing the work of God to be done through them. Yes. Hallelujah. And their enemies were starting to come to want to learn. How many of you know it's an awesome thing when people say, man, I want to have what you got? I want to have what you have. Why, why, how can you stand in the midst of this? This last week, we did the celebration of life for Elva's daughter, Crystal, 24 years old. You know, and we did, I, I told Elva, we don't know why God took her. But yet, when we came to the celebration, folks, I, w I was here, Gary was here, Ronnie Norman was here, and Scott was here. We were running and washing chairs and setting them up. Because they just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming until this whole, every seat was filled and they were eight feet, eight, eight person deep on the sides, all the way around standing. That whole place up there was full. Because this 24 year old girl, even though she had, had, had things in her life that got, she hadn't settled yet, she showed the love of God to people. And because of that, they all came. And her employer, the head boss, came and said she was, she was different. She had, hey, how you doing? You know, she, 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 she sort of had that sway with her and all that. But he said, when I saw her working with the children, I knew she had a calling from God because God's love just poured out of her. I want you to know that when you're living the things of God, people will start to be drawn. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When you're living it, when you preach it, some are going to run from you because they don't want to hear the truth. But you know what is awesome? The word of God never returns void, but always accomplishes that which it set out to do. And that which you have planted in them and spoke over them that they rejected and ran from is still going to have effect in their life. Someday, some point, they're going to remember what you said. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. This church was on fire, if you will. I'm glad you're so excited about fire. Hallelujah. He goes on and he says, not only will they come and, and worship before you at your feet, they will know that I have loved you. They will know that the way you are living is supernatural. That there's no way for you to love the way you love. 
in human capacity. Amen? Amen. That it is supernatural love of God. And that it will not mix or mingle with unholiness. Amen? Amen? So God wants us to walk in this type of thing. Then he says, because you have kept my command to persevere. God gave us a command to persevere. In other words, don't give up. Amen. Amen? He gave us a command not to give up. How many people give up on their marriage, give up on their finances, give up on everything, and they turn back to the world? How many Christians in all of this pressure that's been upon us of stay in your home and you can't go to work have turned to alcohol or medication or drugs to find some kind of answer? A lot of Christians have. And God says, why are you giving up? If you learn to persevere and live this way, the doors open and you'll be at rest. You'll be at peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What if they take all of our money away? Will you be at peace? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir. That's, that's me. I'll do it. Just leave me some ice cream. You see, it's easy for us to say, I'll do it right now. When it comes, you better know what you already got inside of you. Amen. I had my pastor, when my first pastor I ever had, Louis Paul Lehman, he got up and his whole message was toothpaste. He walks up with the toothpaste tube and he says, what's inside of you? You never know until the pressure's on and he squeezed that that, that toothpaste tube and it came shooting out like four feet. And he says, wow, isn't that amazing? It said it was toothpaste and that's what's in it. You say you're a Christian. Is that what's in it? When the pressure is on, what's shooting out four feet from you? Amen. What's shooting out of you? What's coming out of your mouth? Not what goes in, but that which comes out that defiles you. Amen? I think that's a great illustration. for. I should have brought a tube of toothpaste today. But the thing is, this church had the key. They understood what, what Jesus did, who he is, and how he's still active today in our lives. And how he wants us to join with him and walk with him. Amen. I, again, I hear many Christians saying, well, I don't have to do anything. He died for me. Well, then you want to, how many have ever saw that picture and there's two footprints, two sets of footprints walking along the beach and then there's only one. And, they, and, 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 and those people who say that just, you know, they love that picture, but they forgot one important thing in that picture. You were walking beside him for a while before he started carrying you. Yep. And they say, he carried me through my trouble. Well, on the other side, you got to start walking again, which means you got to walk with him. You got to do his word with him. Hallelujah. Because you have kept my command to persevere. Folks, to persevere means I have joined the war. I'm going to battle through until the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to fight the fight that Paul said he fought. I fought the fight of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I fought and I won. I finished my course with joy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So he says to us, he says, you're going to have to persevere. That means you have to put on the armor of God. Because if you're going to persevere against the enemy, you got to have the armor to protect you against the wiles of the enemy. Ephesians 6 tells us that whole story. You got to put on the armor. You got to guard your mind. You got to guard your heart. You got to guide your guts, your emotion. You got to have your feet shod with the preparation of peace. You got to have your weaponry ready to move and to defend you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
God is saying to us, he said, look, you've got to persevere. To do that, you have to know how to fight. And it's not by yelling at the devil. (laughs) Folks, you fight by getting so full of God, the devil can't come nigh thee. What happened? Jesus was full of knowledge and wisdom and the glory of his father. And what happened when, the, when Satan came near him? Jesus just, just turned to him and with three easy questions rebuked the enemy so that the enemy said, I'm out of here. Yes. And all he did was quote the word of God. Yes. Amen? Amen? You have to stand in, in God. If you're, if you're fully alive in God, the enemy's afraid of you. You don't have to be afraid of the enemy. Praise the name of the Lord. You don't have to be afraid of the enemy. The only thing the enemy can do to you, the worst thing they can do is take your life. What what is that? That means they just punched your ticket to heaven. Jesus said, you don't have to fear those who can take your life. Fear the one that can throw your soul and your body into hell. That's him. Have a reverence for him. Surrender to him. And you don't have to worry about the enemy. And when I say not worry about the enemy, you have to be conscious of what he's doing because wisdom reveals the snares. You have to know how he lays traps. That's why the word of God is full on teachings of what the enemy does. So we'll recognize what he's doing and stop it with the key of David, the authority, the anointing, the word, the presence. The mercy of God, the weapons we've taught you on. Hallelujah. Persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I will keep you from the hour of trial. This is pre-tribulation rapture where most people get, this, get the belief in this, but the, the hour of trial is actually referring to the three woes of Jacob, which is the last three years of tribulation, three and a half years of tribulation. So... Again, you can study all the raptures you want to, to study it and find out what God is saying. But what God is saying here is you're not going to have to go through the hardest time the world has ever seen. Even though I'm going to test the rest of the world with it, you don't have to take the test. Amen. Amen. Now that could mean that we're getting out of here before the full seven starts. Could mean we're getting out of here three and a half years into it. Or it could mean we live all the way through it, but God keeps us. And that, that Revelation chapter 20, when he says, this is the rapture, I took all my people out. Folks, don't get caught up in one rapture. Don't get caught up in one taking out. Scripture, you can prove anything you want in Scripture about the rapture, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, amillennial, pre-millennial, post-millennial. There's Scriptures for all that, and I want, to, want you to know why. God said, I don't want anybody to know when I'm coming. I want you guessing. And so I've always said this. I preach seven raptures. But I'm going to tell you this. It doesn't matter if there's one, seven, or four, or three, or when we go. The only thing that matters, are you ready when it happens? That's what really matters. Because too many people are hanging their hat on, we're getting out of here before it gets too bad. Well, what if we have to go through it and it gets too bad? They're not strong enough to handle it. Because, oh God, what happened? I thought you were going to come. They'll give up on God. Why? Matthew 24. Because lawlessness increases, their hearts wax cold and the great falling away. When you want it to be easy street and you're not prepared for anything else, just like if an earthquake came and knocked down all of the highways and we had no food, if you don't have food stored up and water stored up, what are you going to do? You need to be prepared church, and I'm telling you, get prepared for what's going to take place starting next week. Militias are already saying on both sides, civil war is coming. They're already declaring it. They're saying it. Congressmen are saying it. It's not not, not only next week is the uh, election, but on Monday is the confirmation of a Supreme Court justice. Folks, things are going to heat up. 
But if you're already heated up on the inside, the fire is greater in you than the fire on the outside. You're ready to stand. You're prepared. Get spiritually prepared, mentally prepared, and physically prepared for that which is about to come. Again, the worst thing that could happen is that you're finally on fire for God. Your mind is set on Christ, so you're mentally prepared. And you have extra food and water that you can bless other people with. So there, there's a win-win on that side, and there's a lose-lose on this side. Hallelujah. This church was on fire. The workers of Satan are going to come and say, wow, you knew the truth, and you're living in it. Teach us. Because you persevered. I'll keep you from that hour of trial. That word keep doesn't mean that he has removed us. It doesn't literally say anything about taking us out. It just says that we're kept away from the trial. Amen? Amen. And he come to test the whole earth. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to do this because I want to wake my children up. Because it is the last day. My prophecy is coming to pass. And you don't have any more time. So look at what's happening and pass the test. Get ready. Get, get ready. And if you get ready before, you don't have to take the test. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. That's a good thing. How many of you would love to be studying for uh, your master's degree or BA or, or high school diploma or whatever, and you walk in there and you just speak to the teacher, and the teacher says, you are so intelligent, you pass with an A, you don't have to take any tests. How many think that would be awesome? Hallelujah. Well, you know, in college, you can do that. You can challenge courses. If your knowledge level is right, but you have to take a test. You take a test, you challenge the course, you write the things down, you give a little uh, 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 report on it, you know, and you turn it into your teacher, and all of a sudden, you got your college credits. Don't have to spend the time in that class. Come on, church. Now, to do that, you already have to be learned up, studied up. Same thing with God, folks. Let's get learned up. It's, you know what? I found this out true, to be true in my life. If I know everything on the test, it's not really a test. It's just a matter of writing down what I already know. I'm not sitting there trying to figure out, ooh, ooh, what was that? How, how, how did that equation work? I don't have to. It's not a test. A problem's not a problem if you already have the answer to the problem. Amen? Hallelujah. What am I going to eat for dinner is not a problem if your wife has already cooked dinner. You're not wondering. You already know it's sitting right in front of you. Well, if you know him, he's sitting right in front of you. Oh, come on, church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He says, it's going to test them. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have. The enemy's going to try to take it. Hold fast. Don't bend. Don't break. Don't let your emotions guide you. Get your emotions in line with the Word of God. Get your mind thinking upon the Word of God. Respond with the Word of God. Respond with the corresponding actions of that Word. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. In other words, there's an enemy still wanting to get your crown. Don't let him take it, and don't let him use other people to take your crown. Now, he's giving them a warning. He's just told them they're an awesome church. They're on fire. They're going to cause even their enemies to worship before them. He's telling them all this. I know your works, and man, you're doing a great job. But he gives them a warning. Someone's still after your crown. So in other words, you can't relax. Now, when I say can't relax, you're going to rest in God, but you can't stop studying. You can't stop praising and praying. You can't stop worshiping. 
You can't stop living the truth. You can't take a vacation from God. Amen? Amen. If you're living in God, you don't need something else to cause you to rest. You already have the rest that he has promised. Amen? Amen. So he says that he wants you to keep your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and you shall go out no more. Hallelujah. He's saying, if you walk in this, you'll have a permanent residence in the presence of his father. And you will be a pillar in that temple. Now, a pill, how many ever heard of a pillar of society? He's talking about that to us. You're not actually going to be a pillar holding up the roof. You're going to be a pillar in the temple. How many of you know throughout all eternity, we're going to research the fathomless riches of God? Pillars will be there helping others learn those things in God. Amen. Amen. He's saying you're going, to, you're going to be, if you will, standouts in my kingdom. Some people say, no, we're all the same. God says you shall be known as you are known when you get to heaven. Yeah. And he says some are going to make it as though they are crispy critters. Because all their works are going to be burned up. Because they weren't on, based on God. They made it into heaven but all their works are burnt up. Others are going to have crowns to throw at the feet of Jesus because they earned them while they were on this earth. And they kept them. They didn't let someone steal them. They kept them, and they become the pillars in the kingdom of God. I can't even fathom that, folks. That goes beyond my comprehension as a man to think that any of us could be pillars in the kingdom or the temple of God. But that's what God's word said. And if God said it, it is the case. Amen. Amen. So he says, you'll go out no more. You'll have no reason to go out for anything. Everything will be there. Hallelujah. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. Hallelujah. So how many of you remember we, we were going to get a little white rock with a new name? You're going to get that as an overcomer in Christ. But also, if you're part of the church of Philadelphia, you get more than that name. You get the name of God put on you, and you get the name of new Jerusalem put on you, along with your new heavenly name. Hallelujah. And I will write on him my new name. We're going to get the new name of Jesus written on us. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. If we get a chance someday, we'll talk about the tribes of Israel and the breastplate that the, and the ephod that the high priest wore and how the new names are talking about how we take on the character and the nature of the work and position that each tribe was supposed to do for the glory of God, their work, their effort in the, in the, the temple or the tent of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, how that's going to be written on us because we walk with the authority of the key of David in his holiness and in his truth. Hallelujah. God, God, has, God has rewards for his children. He who has an ear, everybody grab hold. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is, this, what is God saying? He said there is the possibility, the hope, the reality that you can rise higher in your walk with God than you are right now. Amen? Oh, come on. Amen? Because I, I, honestly, folks, I pastor pastors. I, I, I counsel a lot of pastors. I've had pastors say to me, well... This is all there is. There ain't no more. And I go, you're so, that's why you're in the problem you're in. It's because you think you've reached the height of who God has called you to be. God says, no, it's a continual, 
growth. It's a continual education. It's a continual increasing anointing. It's a continual purpose being defined in your life. You never will fulfill it because even in heaven, as I said earlier, we're going to search the fathomless riches of God throughout all eternity. Don't limit God. Don't limit yourself. Don't say, I can't do it. God just told us through this church, every one of us can get there. Every one of us can walk in this. Every one of us can have an awesome communication with the Heavenly Father. Every one of us can look around and say, God, why am I in the midst of this situation? For what purpose have you sent me here? How will I profit out of it? How will I touch the lives of someone else? Rather than, oh God, this is a mess, get me out. God, how? How will you use me? Here I am, use me. With an excitement, with a joy, and with an expectancy that God's going to flow. That the Spirit of the Lord is going to flow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some might say, God, my back is hurting, my knee is hurting. God wants you to quit talking about what's hurting and start talking about who's healing. Start talking about how God can move. Your finances are low. Don't talk about how low my finances are. Talk about how God is so abundant and can deliver to us anything that we need. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can all become people of faith. Yes. Not people that are just, I want a million dollars, God. People are using faith to become like him with his character, his nature. People are looking to say, I want to walk in your holiness. I want to walk in your truth. I want people to see Christ in me. That's more important than having things. After all, our governor is going to take away all of our cars by, by 2035, and you'll all be driving electric ones. Some of you say, I'm already driving one. Well, good for you. Hallelujah. <laughs> what I'm saying is everything's going to be taken away. We don't take nothing with us. When I go to heaven, there ain't nothing on this earth I want to take with me. The only thing on this earth I do want to take is souls. I want to take souls to heaven. Hallelujah. I want people saved. I want my brothers and sisters to have marriages that are full of joy and happiness. I want my brothers and sisters not to be fighting some addiction in their life. I want my brothers and sisters to have whole bodies and sound minds. Hallelujah. Yeah. For, let's, let's look at for the spiritual things that make all the difference in the world. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. All of our money may be gone by the end of the year. Glory to God. We may be in civil war next week. Glory to God. There may be great chaos and not enough food on the shelves. Glory to God. You say, Pastor, why? How can... I already got food stored up. I got an office so full of food, I could eat on it for a year. I got water stored. Why? I'm prepared. And if my neighbors need food and water, I got food and water for my neighbors. Because I want them to know Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I got extra of a lot of stuff. Not just food. Extra a lot of stuff. Batteries. Flashlights. Because if they turn off our power, I got flashlights for my neighbors. I got batteries for my neighbors. Because I'm going to reach my neighbors for Jesus. Hallelujah. Folks, there's nothing wrong with preparing for what could come but I'm not afraid of it. I see it as a chance for us to win more souls to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Boy, some of you are looking at me like deer in the headlights. So many Christians, I'm going to finish with this, are fighting over earthly things. I don't like the way you did this. I don't like the way you did that. You're putting too much pressure on me. You know, you need to stop that. 
they're yelling at each other in their homes. They're, they're having arguments. They're, they're looking on how they can cheat to get more money. They're looking on trying to get rich quick. They're looking at all these things. Folks, all you have to do is trust in God. God will make a way for you. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. God will make a way. He will give you the wisdom to take care of your finances. He will give you the wisdom. Amen. I gave you wisdom this morning about your finances. You need to go to your bank and say, what kind of digital accounts are you setting up? Boy, you're all looking at me like, I ain't doing that. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. I've made $40,000 in the last six weeks off digital investments. Folks, I'm telling you, God will give you the wisdom. I don't own any digital currency. I'm just investing in it. And I'm going to sell my stock, take my money, and say thank you. But folks, listen. I'm just saying this. I didn't say that to impress you. Folks, listen to me. God will give you the wisdom so that you can be debt-free, walk with God, and be okay. Because if you have debt, they can take it away from you when you can't pay for it. If you have it paid for, they can still take it away, but it won't happen as fast. Hallelujah. God, people, sell out to God. That's all I can tell you. Sell out to God. Love him with all your heart. Run hard after him. Learn everything you can about him. Study, and I'm going to say this to you. I know there's a lot of good books out there you can read. You need to study this before you study a lot of books. You need to know what this says. So when you read a book, you can find out if that guy that wrote that book knows what this says. You need to find out what this says and stay faithful to it. You, Church of Philadelphia, praise the Lord. Blessed Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We love you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor for everything that you've done for us, Lord God. And Father, as we prepare ourselves to be those soldiers of the light, as we prepare ourselves to go forth as evangelists and witnesses, as we prepare ourselves to be living examples of your love and your glory and your holiness, as we prepare ourselves to walk through that door that is open for us, Lord God. We thank you and we praise you that it is you that is doing this work inside of us. It is you that is doing this work in our minds, renewing us. It is you that is giving us power to put our flesh under. It is you that is renewing our mind that we might put on Christ. We just thank you and we praise you, Lord God. Father, I thank you for the Spirit because the Holy Spirit right now is showing each one how to stand on their own with God. Father, you spoke to me and told me too many people are dependent on other people to pray for them. Too many people are dependent on other people's power in you to heal them and deliver them. When you want each one of us to walk in that power and that authority. So that together when we come in prayer, the power is truly magnified. We just thank you and we praise you as you're teaching each one of us to walk in the authority of the key of David, the anointing of the key of David. For Father, upon our shoulders rest your kingdom as we share it one with another. Help us to communicate one with another and love each other with a love that is unconditional. Help us to love each other through your holiness and bring conviction where conviction is needed without any judgment. Father, we just thank you and praise you as you change our lives, transform our lives. For Father, it is our desire to be an individual in that church, to be that church called Philadelphia. So we just thank you, we praise you, 
We ask your blessing, Father, in Jesus' mighty and holy name. And all the saints said? Amen, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now, next week, folks, don't make any lunch plans because we're having a big feed here at the church. And we're going to bless you all with lunch. Amen? So be, be sure to stay after, and we're going to have a great lunch together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to pray with one another. We're going to praise God together. And we're going to be that church that spreads the holiness and the truth of God one to another. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Go in the peace, the grace, the mercy of God. Take me back to the place that feels like home. To the people I can depend on. To the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse. Where they've seen me at my worst. To the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church.